Today, uh, we're joined by Craig Brazell and Scott Matheson. Uh, thank you guys for joining us. Um, really great to have you guys on here. And I don't, I think we're just going to get right into it because it looks like Michael, um, who's in Yokohama, is, is not going to be able to join us. Uh, maybe probably at the end, I think is more likely. So we'll talk about our NPD update then. Uh, but for now, we'll, let's get into uh, the, uh, the crux of it. And uh, so I'm going to start off uh, just with an introduction of you guys. Uh, make sure everyone knows your, uh, your background. Um, and then I'll ask each of you a couple introductory questions. But um, our guests on the call, um, as usual, I recommend uh, or ask that you just go ahead and um, use the raise hand feature um, on your, uh, by clicking the participants button. And uh, you can raise your hand right away and on, we're gonna start doing audience Q&A and I'll sprinkle in my questions with yours, but I wanna make sure you guys have a chance to ask whatever you want of uh, Craig and Scott. So- Is there a mute button for tonight? There is a mute button, um, which most people are all on. And uh, I don't know, I think that the, uh, the mute button uh, is gonna be less relevant for us there here we than, go. than in our other- uh, <laughs> And the other activities for tonight. Uh, there's no, uh, there is a, t Leon, I know you, you're a time moderator in the past, so uh, you can be our two minutes un uninterrupted guy, all right? <laughs> yeah, we can leave politics out of this one. This is the <laughs> yeah. fun stuff. This is baseball. Right? Exactly. Yeah, you leave it at the door. Leave your feelings at the door. <laughs> there you go. Exactly. All right. So um, I'm just going to uh, put, Craig, I'm spotlight there for a second so everyone can see you and your cool man cave looks like you got there. Um, yeah, I'm slowly working it. We've we moved into a new house, so I'm slowly kind of getting, I'm still pulling stuff out of boxes. So. There you go. Well, maybe uh, if you got any highlight items, maybe you can share them with us. But for now, I'm just going to introduce everyone, a uh, little background. So Craig played 17 professional seasons by my account in the U.S. in Japan. Um, he was drafted by the Mets in the fifth round in 1998 um, out of Jeff Jefferson Davis High School in Montgomery, Alabama. Um, then he, he worked his way up to the big leagues with the Mets um, in 2004. If, I'm not sure if we got any Cubs fans on the call here, but mm -hmm. they, uh, they may uh, remember him, remember cursing him when he hit his first big league home run and kind of crushed their season. <laughs> Um, and uh, spent some time with the Dodgers, then the Royals, where he got back to the big leagues again. Um, and then in, in 07, Craig led the minor leagues in home runs, and uh, that got the uh, Japanese team's attention, and uh, the Cebu Lions came calling and signed Craig um, for the 08 season. Um, and uh, that's the season, as many of you know, that the Lions won the Japan Series. He helped them to the pennant by hitting 27 homers. Um, and then he went on to the Hanshin Tigers, uh, where Tigers fans always remember him for uh, his 2010 season when he hit 47 home runs, led the yeah. Tigers to the playoffs, his name best nine. Um, and then he also spent a couple of years with the Marines, Chivalote Marines. Um, in all, it was seven seasons in Japan, 133 home runs. Um, so, uh, you know, little up and down start to the career in the U.S., but really cemented his legacy in Japan. And uh, that's why we have you on here today. So thanks again for joining us, Craig. No problem. Did I miss anything there? I think I, I think I covered it all, huh? I think so. That's that's everything in a nutshell. <laughs> good enough. Good enough. All right. So now, Scott, I'm gonna get you on here. All right. All right. There you are. Your time in the spotlight here. All right. So Scott Matheson, born and raised in the Vancouver area came up through the Canadian uh, baseball development system, he represented the country at a young age and, and still did throughout his career. Uh, he was 17th rounder in 02 out of high school by the Phillies. Uh, he quickly became a uh, hard throwing top prospect in the organization, reached the big leagues at just 22. Um, that same year in 2006, pitched in the first ever WBC uh, for Team Canada. Um, like I mentioned before, he's represented Canada in many competitions, uh, international competitions. Um, so he had that quick start, got to the big leagues quickly, um, but then started uh, battling some injuries, never really got the permanent spot with the Phillies. And then 
ended up signing with the Yamiuri Giants, and that's where his career really took off uh, for the 2012 season. Um, and he really earned a rightful spot in the Giants pantheon of beloved players. Uh, as a reliever, um, he was uh, he helped the Giants three pennants, um, including the Japan Series, um, and uh, really played a key role in, in that Japan Series in 2012 as well in his first year. Uh, his veteran leadership and buy-in with the Japanese culture made him beloved by teammates and fans, and he was an evidence by he was uh i believe it you're the first foreign player to be named a captain of the giants is that right <laughs> that's what i was told and you missed we had four we had four pennants not just three. Oh, three pennants all right my bad thank you for correcting me all right yeah. yeah we ended up winning four so that was pretty cool right on all right so there you go even better than i'm describing him yeah. um so yeah thanks again for joining us scott really appreciate it oh of course thanks for having me on here yeah yeah totally um, so I'd like to just jump into um, some questions. I guess I'll start just with the basic one for both of you. And, and Scott, since you're on here, I'll start with you. Can you just talk a little bit about how the opportunity to go to Japan first came up and what your decision-making process was in, in saying yes? Yeah, it was, um, it was a little bit of a shock at first. Uh, I remember Scott Profock, who was uh, the Phillies assistant general manager at the time, called me and told me he had good news and bad news. And uh, the bad news is that I wasn't gonna be a Philly any longer, but the good news was I had options. And uh, he said that I had a chance to go to San Diego if I wanted to, or Japan. So I told him San Diego sounded great. And <laughs> then we talked a little bit more and I realized that Japan was probably a lot better, at least at the time, financial move. And you know, for me, I think after 10 seasons with the Phillies and in the States, it was, uh, it was just a fresh start was, you know, well needed for me and, um, you know, welcome the opportunity to go over there and really uh, lo loved every experience I had in Japan. Right on. All right, Craig, how about you? What was your uh, original option and decision like? <laughs> you know, I was actually approached in 2004, 2005, like right when I first got to the big leagues when I was 24, 25 years old. Because I had actually played, um, I'd gotten to know Shinjo when he came over and he was with the Mets and everything like that. And then Kaz Matsui was with the Mets. So there was mumblings, hey, hey, you should go to Japan. You should go to Japan, yada, yada, yada. And I was like, no, I'm, I'm still not ready for it yet. And um, I broke my hand in 2006, I think it was, yeah, or five, one of them. And uh, went to the Dodgers just kind of as a babysitter role the next year. And that year I'd gotten a little more uh, interested in going to Japan and wasn't really playing every day because I was still rehabbing. And then the in 07, I got approached probably four or five times when I was with Kansas City when I was leading the minor leagues in home runs. And I mean, it would be every other week, somebody would contact me about going. And of course, Kansas city would be like, no, we don't really want you to go yet. Cause we may call you up to the big leagues. And they didn't call me up till September, but, uh, but when it got into the off season, it kind of got a little more real for me when my agents said, look, uh, Kansas city's going to let you go no matter what or you can go to Japan. And I went, well, okay, I guess Japan looks good. And like, kind of like Scott said, it was a fresh start. And I'd just kind of been burned a bunch over here and had heard a lot of things about, good things about Japan. But then you uh, think when you go over there, hey, I'm going for one year, then I'll be back. My one year turned into seven and that's where it was. Yeah. Scott, did you think it was just going to be a year? Uh, to be honest, I went over not even just looking for a fresh start. Um, 12 hours before I got on that first flight, we found out my wife was pregnant. Wow. And uh, it was quite a whirlwind first year. My son was born over there. Actually, both my kids are born in Japan. And um, I had so much fun playing there my first year and finally playing on a championship team and in a meaningful role that, you know, I was – definitely looking at it for the long haul or at least for you know another season and 
uh, after my second year, every year after that, I had major league offers, but you know, the giants would always find a way to beat it and, you know, find a way to convince me to stay. And, uh, it, it wasn't hard because uh, I love Tokyo and, you know, they, as much as you hear how hard Yomiri can be, they always treated me really well. And, um, I felt like I was always, you know, uh, warmly received there. Yeah. So you mentioned being part of the championship team in, in the first year and you both were in your first year was, I guess in general, what was that like? And, and did you, were you able to kind of grasp the significance or was it just kind of a whirlwind it being in year one? Well, for, for me, I was with the Phillies when they won the world series, but I was rehabbing. So I was there for every game. I got to, you know, experience all that, but I felt, you know, it, it wasn't, I felt like it wasn't, I shouldn't have been there. And I felt um, like I wanted to experience it for myself and be, you know, that one on the field. And, you know, I, I was a big part in that first year. And when we won it, you know, they gave me the ball, um, you know, I, I was closing in the final series and it, it was just, it was such a surreal experience. And, you know, it was one of those things that I, I got along with everybody and I just didn't want that, that to end. And we ended up winning three championships in a row that uh, when I first got there. Yeah. Wow. And Craig, how about you? What was that? I, I know you didn't play in the series because of an injury, but what was that like um, for you? Oh, it's, it was a whirlwind over there and uh, you get there. And I mean, you go from, I mean, Obviously, going from Kansas City to uh, uh, Cebu, I mean, it was a big change. I mean, and all those kids on that team, I mean, they were all young when I got that my first year in Japan. Uh, Nakajima, Kataoka, Wakui. So, I mean, you get there and it's like, okay, you walk into a season where nobody really expected you to do anything, but all these kids kind of came to life. And then once that season gets going, you get on the get in the playoffs, man. It is craziness, and uh, just everything about it is awesome. Playing over there, uh, I mean, I, I've been to World Series over here. Never got to play in one. Never got to play in the playoffs or anything. But I mean, it, it's my comparison is is you can't beat the fans in Japan when it comes to playoff time or even baseball. Yeah, yeah. What a cool experience in, in year one. Um, we had a question uh, from a guy, who, Gary uh, Reisenden, who couldn't join us today, but he, he wanted me to ask you a question. He said he remembers that after you left the Lions, um, you were playing for the Tigers and, and you hit a double versus them. It must have been in your first game back. And the second baseman, Kataoka, gave you a big hug at second base. Do you remember that? Yes, he did. Kataoka was, I mean, every time we played against him, it was the when play against him in interleague and everything he'd always come give me a big hug and uh but yeah he was awesome uh i mean those kids were can't call them kids now but they were great to play with i mean it was a lot of fun and i think once i left Cebu, i actually hit really good against them afterwards <laughs> right on all right we got a few people with their hands raised ian you're you're up first Hi, this is a question for both of you. How did your approaches change once you went to Japan? Because in Japan, it's a lot more contact and a lot more pitchers throwing um, junk as compared to throwing fastballs. So did your approach change at all or did it stay the same? I guess I'll jump on this one first. You know, after my first year in Japan, it was... I went with the approach of, all right, I'm here to hit home runs. And that's what they told me to do. They want you, they didn't care. They wanted me to hit home runs, drive in runs. And it worked to an extent because not every single day. And you're going to get a lot of guys that are going to – they'll throw nine splits in a row or nothing but sliders or – I mean, I think I look at it as a hitter. I had took the approach. They wanted to throw me everything that looked like a strike that went out of the strike zone because I had that, I had the reputation. I swung at everything. I was a bad ball hitter. And, uh, but for me, once I got into my second year over in Japan, I got over there with the Tigers with guys like uh, Kanye Moto son and, and Yano son and Arai and guys like that. I had to change my approach. I kind of went with the approach of I'm forgetting everything I know about hitting. I'm learning Japanese way 
which is a lot of put the ball in play, drive the ball the other way. And, and, and it's not so much me working the count or anything, but learn their game and then insert mine where I could. And I think that was after the, uh, the 09 and then the 10 season, that's where it really helped me the most. Yeah, I think at least for me, um, you know, I went over there and in spring training, um, Abe told me real quick to, you know, not think and just, you know, lay it, leave it on him. And, uh, you know, I really followed his lead for the first year. And, you know, I was a power pitcher and I think I was a little bit before my time where there wasn't nowadays, every team has somebody throwing a hundred. And, you know, when I, when I first got over there, I was high nineties touching a hundred and that you didn't see that as often. And so I got away with a lot of fastballs and, you know, I could leave a fastball up in the zone and get away with it over there, at least my first few years. And um, I'd say my first four years, I was dominant fastball pitcher. And then I completely flipped a 180. And um, my last four years, I mean, I would throw more sliders and splits than I would fastballs. I was still throwing hard, but, you know, for four years, that's all everybody saw. And um, my last four years, I got away with, you know, I'd start somebody off with a slider strike one, slider strike two split in the dirt fastball up and then chase it. And, um, you know, I, I really learned how to command my off speed pitches, uh, later in my Japanese career. And I think once I did that, that was something I struggled with leading up until I got to Japan and, you know, I probably overused my off speed. And I think I really, a lot of people really got frustrated with, uh, you know, coming up to face me and seeing four off speed pitches or five off speed pitches in a row. And, you know, I, I would go home and just shake my head at it as well. But, uh, you know, I had success doing it. And, you know, I, it, it was something that I just kind of followed, uh, you know, followed their lead over there. And I, I really just tried to command the zone and get ahead of guys. Well, thank you guys for that. All right. Um, Bob, you're up next. Right. Uh, this is an international uh, baseball question directed at Scott. I don't know. Uh, back in 2011, there was a baseball World Cup in uh, Panama. And so uh, that was the last baseball World Cup ever. Uh, and then that, now they got the, the uh, World Baseball Cup. But uh, Netherlands upset Cuba that year uh, to win the gold. But the other surprise team was Canada. They, they got the bronze. So in 2011, I don't know, I don't remember you being on that team, but I don't know what your, uh, did you have an opportunity to be on that team or were you a little young during that time? No, I, I played in the World Cup in 2005 in Amsterdam. So you, you were probably a little old then. Um, well, I was up and I was up and down from the major leagues and on the 40 man roster. And I don't believe 40 man roster players could, were allowed okay. to play the World okay. Cups. So that's how I missed that. Uh, I, I have never turned down an opportunity to play with Team Canada and you know, I'm still throwing and trying to trying for that 2021 uh, Olympics in Tokyo right now. Yeah, well, that'd be good. But the 2011-12 years, that seemed to be the prominent years for the Canadian teams. And they haven't been the same since then. So any yeah, thoughts yeah, on that? Or? You had a lot of turnover. That was like Scott Richmond. And a lot of guys were kind of at their end, end of their career. Uh, or at least there's that turnover of Canadians from the major leagues that were kind of getting taken off the 40-man roster. Yeah. but we're still playing. So you had a lot of experience and then you had a guys like Tyler O'Neill who were really young at the time, you know, top yeah. prospects coming up. And, uh, you know, so you had the kind of that combination of the young and old there. And, but yeah, Canada's definitely struggled since. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know what it is, but it, it's, it's hard when, you know, your country's the size of California in population. And, well, and you, you'll probably get a kick out of this. The one thing I remember uh, is I was at the airport and a bunch of the Canadians had their bronze medals and the U.S. team also was nearby and the Canadians were giving them a hard time about the uh, we got the bronze and you got shut out so <laughs> that was kind of yeah. cool. That, that's uh, one thing I, I love about playing for Canada is that I feel like we're very patriotic for you know to play in our country and I, I feel like anytime we've ever played the U.S. you know guys sit out they don't play it's all about money where I, I don't I mean, there's a few Canadians, but there's really not many guys that, you know, they'll risk it and go play for their country. And it's just, it's such a, sm a tight knit and small community in baseball in Canada that, 
you know, every January, January, we all still get together in Toronto and we have a big banquet and a party. And, you know, we, we go out for, for a weekend, a real long weekend, but uh, it's just such a tight knit community that like, you know, even a bronze medal where you know, third place, but you're proud of it. Cause it's, oh, yeah. yeah, no, that, I mean, that, and, and then you beat, you beat a U.S. team. So that, that was, that was good for them, I guess. So yeah, I, definitely. I, I thought it was pretty cool. Yeah, they won. They won the Pan Am Games. Uh, I don't even yeah, know, the following years year. Yeah, and that yeah, yeah they, 12, I think. same group. Yeah, and I missed. I missed out on that. And I was. Uh, I wish I could have done that as well. But you know, they beat us in the finals, and that was pretty yeah. cool. Yeah. Scott, what do you, what does Canada have to do to qualify uh, for Tokyo? Well, the, the, these stupid Olympics. Only six teams qualify. Well, yeah, five because Japan's a buy. So there's supposed to be a qualifier. They, uh, the one in Taiwan was canceled, and um, there was one in Arizona that was canceled. So we're waiting on the qualifier. So pretty much we have to, I think, come first or second in the qualifier. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and I, I don't know who all we're playing. You know, hopefully nobody shows, shows up. But, <laughs> uh, hey, you never know. You never know. Yeah. Unfortunately, the U.S. is another team that has to qualify. So. And I think there's two spots left, too. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. I two think right now. Yeah, right now is Japan, Korea, Australia, and Mexico. Israel, or Israel and Mexico. Yeah. Yeah, I Israel, mean, Mexico. That, I mean, Israel. Come on, it, it's Team USA D. It's not Israel. <laughs> but hey, what? Yeah. All right. Well, thank, Bob, thanks for that question. You always, we can always count on you for the international uh, questions. Eric, I'm going to you next. Eric. Hey. Uh, Craig and Scott, thanks for joining us. Um, question about tr uh, training regimen and, and kind of what you guys had to change or adjust when you went over coming from, you know, playing ball in the States in the minor leagues and then going over to Japan. Um, you know, big differences, any adjustments you had to make, you know, reps or just now throwing, things like that. Um, well, I think my first year I had to do a lot. My, my uh, I really had to do a lot, especially with Saban, because I mean, they want to see what you're you're all about. <laughs> and I will say, uh, you do a lot more running in Japan than you do here. And here, <laughs> even position players, and then uh, and you swing the bat a whole lot more. I mean, I can remember my first spring training with Saban. After <laughs> three days, I had to take three days off from hitting because I couldn't. My hands were blistered to to all get out and they just believe in the reputation and the repetition the repetitions and just getting your work in and that's it's funny you always hear the joke oh it's eyewash no the, these guys are taking it serious and they i mean they generally they they want to be the best at what they do so i will say that towards the end of my career my uh regiment was a little different i didn't have to run as much and do as much hitting it's just once you kind of proving yourself over there they they they'll leave you alone and let you do it they know you know what you need to do to get ready to play did, yeah, did, I, oh, go ahead scott go ahead scott i was gonna say i agree with that uh the running is just well <laughs> it, it, it's a lot and you know for me i've always been a long or i was a long distance runner and um i had a lot of aspirations to do an iron man when i got done playing and um you know i used to run 5k 10k half marathons in the off season so it wasn't awful for me going over there, but it, it's a lot. It's just rep. I mean, PFPs in the U S are for 15 minutes in Japan. It's an hour and 15 minutes. Yeah. Uh, you know, I remember my first year we had 6 AM meeting out on the beach in Miyazaki and we had to complete a two mile run before we, you know, the 6 AM meeting and our first uh, 10 days in uh, spring training was always two days. We'd go home for dinner and then come back and we'd have like, you know, bunting and whatever in the, so it was, it was a lot. Um, the biggest thing that stood out for me, and that's something that I did throughout my whole career. And looking back, I wish I didn't because I blew my knee out my last year and I can't run at all now. So I, I picked up biking and I bike a lot. But um, the one thing is they throw. They throw so much. And my first season over there, you know, I was off three, three major elbow surgeries, two Tommy Johns and an ulnar nerve. Um, and every time I threw, my arm would swell up and, you know, after my surgeries. And it was always painful but I could throw and I was, I had success doing it. So, you know, I didn't think much of it. I just thought that was my new norm. Um, so halfway through my first season, they wanted to shut me down before the all-star break. 
and for me to get a stem cell injection in my elbow, which I had never heard of at that time. Hmm. Um, so I did that and, or they promised me that they would resign me for the second year if I would do that. And I had to do the stem cell injection and get on their throwing program. And so I, I ended up doing that and I came back and the second half of the season and, you know, I did everything they told me and uh, I ended up throwing a bullpen every single game of the season for the next seven and a half years. So I would, in the sixth inning of every game, I'd get hot. I'd throw 15 pitches at 80% in the sixth inning and then sit down and wait for my turn. And I, I'd throw off the mound every day. And it was something that at first it was hard, but, you know, it was just the norm at the end. And I have, my arm feels like I'm 19 years old again. I mean, it, my, to this day, my arm, I, was, I threw a bullpen the other day and I was 94. Uh, you know, my arm feels great. I just wish my knee would do the same. Did, did either of you guys, like, did you have the option to just do your own regimen or, or did you just want to buy in and do, do what the teammates were doing? Everybody I saw, like, they, they always gave you the option, but everybody who took the latter of the two were not there much longer. So, yeah, yeah. And, yeah and that, that was, that's, it, it, it's kind of get in and you're not going to fit in. Yeah. yeah. And, and cause I mean, and, and you know, I had guys, I mean, obviously Scott played with some of the big superstars of Japan with Abe and those guys. And um, I, was Ogasawara still there when you were? He, he was, yeah. Yeah, that was, he was one of my idols. I loved watching him hit. No, there was, <laughs> he was awesome. Nobody but took I mean, a strike like he did. I know. Yeah. And then, I mean, I had guys like Connie Moto, Yano, and I mean, and you just, they got to do what they wanted to do, but if you didn't do what the other guys were doing, they'd let you know. And I mean, those are guys you want on your side. Cause I mean, ultimately a lot of those players, I mean, they can kill your career over there. If you don't, if they, if they don't like you there. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I I've heard we we've had some uh, former players on before and they kind of mentioned a similar thing. It's like, you can do your own thing, but if you don't really just buy in and that applies not just to the workouts, but just to everything in general, the cultural buy-in and everything, then it's oh, not yeah. going to be around for long. Yeah. Learn, learn Japan, learn the culture, learn the respect. And then you'll do all right. I mean, I got, <laughs> we got down to, I think it was Miyazaki for spring training with Cebu. I mean, they didn't have silverware down there where we were staying. It was <laughs> chopsticks. Here you go. Welcome to Japan, kid. <laughs> 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 I had no idea Alabama, what they didn't I, teach you in Alabama how to use chopsticks. No, nah, hey, we didn't. <laughs> no, nah, we didn't learn how to do that in Alabama. So <laughs> it was kind of a, a wide open, wide awakening for me. <laughs> All, right. All right, we got some more guest questions. Yumi, I'm going to you. Hi, Yumi. Yeah, hi. Um, I've um, heard how many Japanese. Uh, the major leaguers when they go on the TV, Japanese TV um, of season, they said that um, um, the, when the years goes by, a lot of American, the major leaguers asking how Japanese leagues, you know, I mean, NPB is, and some of the players are more interested in playing in Japan. That's what I heard from the, the, the Japanese major leaguers. Um, so both of you, before you went to Japan, like probably you probably spoke with your you know family and agent, but um, did you speak with any Japanese uh, major leaguers or the players how Japanese league was and then they considered it their advice? I'm very uh, curious. Yeah, for, for me, I had a pitching coach, Rod Nichols, who played over there. And he, he only played one season, but he loved it. And he, uh, well, he said he didn't love it while he was there, but looking back, he did. And uh, he told me a lot about it. Plus, uh, I played for Charlie Manuel, who, I mean, yeah. would always talk about Japan. And, you know, he had quite a career over over there. And um, so I heard a lot of stories from him. And also Ryan Vogelson, I was with him for a year in AAA. And, you know, he talked a lot about, about Japan and, you know, the do's and don'ts and uh, how mm -hmm. he... Utsumi in the head um, and pretty much ended his career with that one. But he, he talked a lot about Japan. And uh, so I, I had a little bit of knowledge going into it. And for me, I mean, I was just excited to see a new culture, to be able to travel the world. I mean, shoot, I get paid to play a ba play baseball. Like it's, I can't complain. I get to 
go and live in one of the largest cities in the world and, you know, experience, I mean, Japan, like who, who gets to do that? It's just to travel there is hard. It, it's expensive and, you know, it's not an easy place to go. So I was very excited. Yeah. And, you know, I, I mean, I was fortunate enough. I had a, a hitting coach one year, uh, Mike Eastler, who talked to me a lot about Japan. But then I also, I mean, like I said, when I was 23, 24 years old, I mean, Shinjo was with the Mets. And yeah. Shinjo was telling me at that time, oh, you got to go, you got to go, you got to go. Uh-huh. And then uh, then I got to play with Kaz Matsui. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, and I had another Japanese player, his name's slipping my mind. He was a star. Um, it'll come to me later. But yeah, so I had a, a lot of people talk to me about it. But I mean, and then again, it goes back to, you know what, you can be told about one thing, but you don't really know it until you get there. Oh, it's a shame because I heard that the Japanese like a payroll system is totally different than American system. So pretty much like the, um, you know, when you think about the payroll, like American players and I mean uh, the major leaguers and Japanese players are like really different, you know. But pretty much the Japanese uh, the team can provide housing and you know whatever 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 all the benefits. So pretty much. You can. You don't really have to use your own money. I heard. <laughs> that, well, that, that, was, that was a big thing for me, to be honest. Yeah. Um, you know, just signing back and contracts going back, where, you know, I really didn't spend much of my money over there, and uh-huh. you know, as much as you hate talking about money and you're playing finance for financial reasons, like, you know, you get to a point where you have a family and you got to make money, and you know, if I could go live there and live a great life and be put up in this beautiful apartment and. I, I had my last four years there, I had a um, car contract over there. So I had a free car. Uh-huh. It was one of those things where, you know, I, I didn't have to spend any money and I would live for nine, 10 months a year. And it, it was awesome. It was, I mean, <laughs> definitely the best time of my life. Uh, so yeah, far. The, the, yeah. It, it was like that with a lot of teams. I mean, they pay for your living. I mean, you can eat at the clubhouse. I mean, it, you're taken care of very well over there. And I mean, so the rumors are true. <laughs> they they yeah. are 100. Yes. Yeah. The foreigners, if I will say, if you're productive, respectful, uh-huh. and do what they say, hey, you'll uh, you'll be taken care of very well over there. All right. Thank you. Oh, no problem. Yep. <laughs> Thanks, Yumi. All right, Gabe, you're up. Hey, Gabe. Evening, Craig. Hey, Evening. Scott, how are you doing tonight? Hey, good. good. How are you doing? Doing great, thanks. Awesome. My question is around memorable fan interactions and any that, that spring to mind as a, the, you know, the most prominent or the, the most important that you've had. Because, Scott, you played for the most popular team in Japan, and Craig, you played in front of two of the loudest and most dedicated Oendon in the league in Hanshin and Lotte. So I'm curious... What stands out in your mind when I mentioned fan interaction and th- that kind of crazy atmosphere? It, it is Ooh. crazy. Um, you get yeah, to see ahead. guys like Sakamoto, and I mean, they're, it's like Justin Bieber, you know, one of those guys walking around the streets. It's like a rock star. It, it's crazy to see that. Uh, not so much in the case for me, but there was definitely um, a select group of fans that would really follow the foreigners and – I mean, still to this day, like I get messages on social media from these guys. I, I mean, every other day, it, it's crazy. It's pictures and just stuff that they're, you know, so stuff like that. Uh, but one of the things that sticks out the most to me is, um, you know, I always tried to put on a smile whenever I was out there. You know, I figured I'm playing baseball. If anybody's watching me, like I'm playing a game, I'm getting paid for it. I can't look like I'm not having fun. I'm not going to be upset. So I always, and I tried to, be polite and interact with people but um something i don't remember the actual interaction but i guess i end up telling uh some girl that you know she is 15 year old girl or something that you know she had pretty hair or a nice dress or something like that down at some point and um when i was with my kids and a few years actually my last year over there um her dad came up and gave me a hug and i had no idea who this guy was but uh i guess she was um had a lot of depression and a lot of issues like that. And, you know, by me doing that and introducing her to Sakamoto, who was with me at the same time, he said like changed her life around. And, you know, she had some issues where she was like cutting herself and, uh, you know, she 
ended up going to therapy afterwards and had a lot, I mean, which in Japan, nobody goes to therapy, nobody speaks of depression and all that. So, you know, that really stood out where, wow, it's something that I don't even remember just smiling and, you know, saying hi to someone was able to change their day and or change their life. And, um, you know, making a superstar like Sakamoto say hi to them that, so that, that meant a lot. And that, that really stood out. Wow. That's yeah, amazing. definitely. I mean, the, the fans in Japan are awesome. I mean, I can remember there, there are certain fans I can remember when I was with Cebu that just took, I mean, went out of their way to kind of take care of me and say, always say hello to me. I mean, brought me gifts all the time. And then you throw Hanshin and Chiba in there. I can remember playing for Hanshin and the game stopping when we were playing in Chiba because a fight broke out in the stands between the Hanshin and the Chiba <laughs> fans hey man that was that was that was daily when we'd play handshake i know (laughs) and i mean that was i mean i'm like hey this is i mean am i at a a, a georgia auburn football game that's nothing new to me (laughs) but but, uh (laughs) no the fans are just passionate and it it, you i can say the handshake fans are awesome the uh chiba's fans even sabu's fans are great but as a total I mean, the fans in Japan, they know the foreigners. They know all of us. And they, everybody, and I, I mean, and I've seen some good fights between Tigers and Giants. During, and I mean, it was unbelievable. Like I know in um, 2010 when we were playing the Giants in the playoffs at Koshin, that place was unbelievable to play in that atmosphere. And, and I, I mean, I even – Today, I still get messages from people on social media talking about that series or a home run at, at Chiba or, I mean, one of the cool ones, I get a lot of people on my oldest son's birthday send me messages because I was actually playing in Yokohama when he was born and hit two home runs in that game that at, within like seconds of him being born. I get messages, people telling me to tell him happy birthday every year. So the, the fans are amazing. There, there's no if, ands, or buts about that. Yeah, hundred percent agree. And you know, Tigers fans are pretty crazy. Um, yeah, it, it, it's funny to me because you know everybody talks about how they're rough and they're crazy. And you know, we'd be taking BP and be out in the outfield, and you look up and somebody would yell at you or give you the finger out there, and and then you just kind of give them a wave, and then they get all happy and they wave back. Yeah, and, uh, it, it, it's mm-hmm. it's so surreal, like especially coming from Philly, where I was, you know. I, I became a prospect with the Phillies and then I think I was a huge disappointment, especially after I got hurt. And, you know, uh, I was a young kid throwing a hundred that, you know, couldn't stay healthy. So I, I definitely got a lot of hate mail and, uh, you know, hatred in, in Philadelphia for a few years, but um, you know, coming over in Japan, it's just, it's, they're so, they just love baseball and they're so passionate about it. And, you know, yeah. even like the Tigers fans that might, you know, yell at you and everything, you just give them a wave and like, they're just so excited for baseball. So that was pretty cool. Yeah. That, that's definitely a big part of it. I mean, I mean, I can, it, it's hard to say which fans are crazier tigers or Marine fans. Um, but it, I have money passion. running on this. Be careful. I have, <laughs> I have a bet going with a friend of mine. Oh, <laughs> I mean, I think there's going to be, I think there's more Tigers fans than there are Marines fans, to be honest with you. And it's just, Ooh, I mean, it's, <laughs> I've seen Chiba stadium rocking. And then I've seen Koshin just unbelievable. I mean, it, it, it's so it's, it's hard to tell. I mean, it, it really is, but I mean, and to be honest with you, like, when we would go to Tokyo to play, I loved playing the Giants in Tokyo Dunk because, I mean, the, you could literally feel the floor shaking. It was awesome playing in there. You mentioned your son, Craig. Is that the one whose middle name is Koshien? No, my, that is my my youngest. His, his middle name is Koshien. Yeah. And is that um, – I mean, obviously you named it after Koshien Stadium. Is that – because you love the ballpark, the team, the fans, the overall experience. What was the? Uh, I think it there? just had to do with the experience of Japan. I really do. You know, I mean, my wife and I both, and even my oldest son, because he spent his first five years over there. I mean, we fell in love with the country. 
and I mean, you, you talk about Japan and to be honest with you, people in America only know really two things of Japan, the Tokyo Dome and the high school baseball tournament. So that's Tokyo Dome and Koshin. And I mean, it's just the history and everything. And, and that's it. And I did have a lot of success at that stadium. So, I mean, that's kind of a, a lot behind it. It's the, the love for Japan. And I always wanted to be able to remember it. Yeah. That's awesome. I love that. All right. Toshiki, you're up. Hey, cool. Thanks Shane. And thank you, Scott and Craig, for being here. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm a Giants fan, so Scott, you were a huge part of my childhood, so thank you. Um, <laughs> you guys, <laughs> you guys kind of talked about it already, but I'd love to hear more about playing against each other, Tigers and the Giants, uh, whenever you guys play each other. You know, like I get pumped up just by talking about it. So uh, if you could kind of, you know, talk about it a little bit more, that would be great. You know, I only, to be honest with you, I think I said it last night to him. Uh, I only faced Scott one time, and that was my I think my last year with the Tigers. I hmm. and I was telling him it was at towards the end of the game, and he came in for some ungodly reason because they were beating our brains out. And I think I was already on my way to the taxi to the hotel, and they told me to come hit. <laughs> so, but I mean. It, Scott was after facing him. I knew he was going to be a success in Japan. You could you could just see that, and and being there as long as I was, you could kind of as I guess once you become that veteran, you can kind of see what players are going to be successful there and not successful. And and if you're seeing him throw a good bit, you could always tell. This. I knew Scott was going to be very successful over there. But as far as the rivalry, you know some of my favorite players were giants players. I mean, a guy that I is Abe and Ogasawara. I mean, I loved those two more than anything. Uh, Cause they were just, they were the epitome of Japanese superstars. I mean, they were awesome to play against. I mean, there would be games. I can remember playing in the Tokyo dome where Abe would say to me, Hey, if you get on second, ball in the gap, please don't run me over. <laughs> um, but I, I had that respect for him, but we always wanted to win so bad against that team. And I think it was, it was the atmosphere, and it goes back to the fans. The fans created such a great atmosphere against us, and there's so much history there. That was, I mean, those are the games you hear about as a, as a, a foreigner coming over there that you want to play in. And, I mean, I loved – the playing in those series. Luckily, I was I was fortunate to get to play in, play in for a good time. Yeah, I think um, the Giants and Tiger series were always the most fun, just because you know it was always sold out. It does, didn't matter where you're at; it was always a big rivalry. And you know, luckily, I played on a lot of championship teams, and we had many years of just beating the Tigers uh, pretty badly. And it, it was a lot of fun. It was just that. You know, I w definitely wouldn't want to be on the other end, but it, it just having that, you know, that big rivalry and on a Tuesday night, there's 50,000 fans there. It, it's crazy. It, it's, um, you know, it's so loud in the stadium. And, you know, for me, I was someone that when I pitched, I didn't hear anything. I didn't know it, it could be nobody there or they could be sold out. But being in the bullpen underneath, you could hear everybody, you know, like, you know had the butterflies all game. And it, it was a, it was a lot of fun. I always, you know, I always loved playing as the Tigers. You know, luckily, I, I feel like I had pretty good success, especially early on against them. But, you know, I remember just battling games. And when I blew up my knee, I, I remember pitching through that game and, uh, you know, ended up getting getting the save, but barely made it get out of it. And uh, it was just those big games against the Tigers st stand out, especially with everybody yelling at you. You come out when, you know, driving the little car from the bullpen and people are throwing beer. They now have the tarps over it, so they can't throw the beer at you anymore. And, it's just it's cool it's um it's surreal i mean we're, we're playing a game and you know yeah. we get to experience that it's it's one of those things that you know i've been out of baseball for less than a year now and i miss it i miss it so bad it's uh it's one of those feelings that you just never will get have. any easier <laughs> yeah I, I imagine i imagine but hey i will i will throw this out just to say with ogasawara 
I mean, there you go, right there. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I, I have one of those hanging up too. It, it's a uh, yeah. You know, it, I mean, it, I mean, not only are we players, we're fans too. <laughs> yeah, it, it's. I, I grew up a baseball. I collecting baseball and hockey cards and memorabilia, and I, I mean, I think I. My, my cherished memorabilia is more is stuff I brought from Japan than anything I have over in the States. Mm -hmm. and, you know, like, like gut, I call them guts, but Ogosora, like yeah. I have a, I have that same bat hanging up. I have a batting cage in, in a, in my garage out here. And I have that hanging up there. I got an Abe Jersey and a Sakamoto yeah. Jersey and a Chono Jersey and just some cool stuff that like, you know, guys, just characters and guys that I was so fortunate to play with. Yeah, definitely. Oh, thanks so much. Well, yeah. uh, Scott, uh, the entire city of Tokyo is waiting for you to come back. So please come back. Uh, I appreciate it. I, hey, man, once, cro once COVID gives a, or uh, cuts out here, I'll be heading back. Uh, I, had, I had an offer to be on a game show and do some pitching there that, unfortunately, I wasn't able to fulfill. And I, I hope I can do that in the spring or something. Great, great. Thanks so much. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you, guys. Uh, yeah, have a good one. Thanks, Thanks too. Cheeky. And uh we confirmed that, yeah, you guys had, you guys faced each other once and Scott, you struck him out. So, mm -hmm. but Craig, hey, he was wearing his shower shoes in the batter box. So it doesn't hey, that, that's, <laughs> all right. that's all right. I, I'll be honest. I, I should never admit this, but I mean, there was times I'd fall behind guys and early, especially early on, like I would rather walk them than, you know, give up a hit or I, I was out there for a strikeout. Like I would throw, <laughs> I, I would throw three, one pitches in the dirt, trying to get guys to chase and, I, I love, I've always loved striking guys out and it's not something you should ever tell a pitcher or teach them. Cause you know, contact and get out early, but man, I, I was always out there for the strikeout. So, you know, I, I was, I, I appreciate I was the, him coming up in his shower shoes. <laughs> hey, I was the one, I didn't want to walk. Yeah. I wanted to hit the ball. I, I mean, I came up in the time when I would rather ground out to the pitcher than strike out. Yep. And for me, I didn't fall in the money ball because if I walked, it still took two hits to get me home. Yeah. I mean, because it's got to be a ball in the gap for me to go first to third. So, I mean, I wanted to hit. I mean, that was just part of it. And, I mean, the teams knew that. If they got me on base, I mean, you get a pretty good chance of rolling up a double play. Right on. Yeah. Cool. Thanks for that, guys. All right, Susan, you're up. Hey, Susan. Hi. Thanks, guys. Um, I love hearing all these stories. So my, my question is, well, um, Yankees great Paul O'Neill said, referred to MPB as being like triple A in, in the States. He's a jerk. Okay. That, well, that's what I was going for. So I want to, if Paul O'Neill were sitting right here on this call, what would you guys say to him to convince him otherwise? My, my, my true feelings about, about that is I think it's a true 4A. It's not major league, but it's not AAA. Uh, you know, at least the teams I played on, we'd be a 500 team in the major leagues probably, and we'd kill, we'd just absolutely kill AAA teams. Um, I think in Japan, the starting lineups are all major league quality players. And then the bench falls off really fast. Um, you, you will have guys on the bench that wouldn't make a triple A team, but the guys that are starting in the field are all very, are major league players um, or very close to it. Yeah. You're going to have a lot of that. I mean, I can, I'll, I'll put one out there for you. Uh, 2010, our starting lineup, I think we had God, I think, six guys with 25 plus home runs and i mean you had a ton of all-stars and I, I believe and and that's where it was it, it's once you get to the bench is where you fall off a lot a lot of guys and the pitching's not the same as it is in the u.s you're not going to see that one through three one through four are going to be frontline starters i mean so that's the big part but i mean for me everybody just automatically thinks oh it's just it, you go over there you'll make a ton of money it's real easy no that's why a lot of guys come over here spend one year and they're gone and uh because it's not as easy as you think it is which um teammate this is for both of you name one teammate you think would have thrived in um major leagues 
I, I personally have many, but um, yeah, I, I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to name two. But I would love to see Sakamoto if he went over as a second baseman, he would be an all star. Um, mm-hmm. And then Abe back in his prime. I remember my first year over there. Oh, yeah. I mean, he Abe in his prime is, I mean, a major league all star hands down. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there, there's nobody that touches him. I mean, so I, those two. I, I know you said one, but those those two both were. I'll We're take easy. two. <laughs> yeah. For me, um, he had one team. <laughs> uh, but for one that's kind of sticking out in my mind is Tortani. Like I said, if Tortani would – he could have played second base, I believe, in the major leagues. And not, not shortstop, but, I mean, Tori could hit. There was just no doubt about it. So, but, yeah, I, I definitely agree with Abe. A hundred percent. Okay, but yeah. what about one from your other teams that you were on to? <laughs> oh gosh, um, Chiba. I can't really say that anybody would be a frontline guy or a good player in the major leagues. Um, Sebu. I mean, obviously Nakajima went over. Um, but. Uh, Earlier in his career, I think uh, Wakui, the pitcher, he when he was younger, I think he might have been all right over there. Yeah. I, I'll say it's, there's two guys I'm really looking forward to coming over to the States, and that would be uh, Suzuki with the cart. Um, I think hands down he's going to be the next big, you know, position player from Japan to come to the U.S., and, you know, obviously I'm excited to see Sagano come over. I wish he could have come over a few years ago. Um, and, you know, it, it's great seeing guys stay with the Giants and win over there. But, you know, selfishly, I want to see guys come over to the U.S. and succeed and, you know, show how good the league is over there. But, uh, you know, I, I do hope Sagano gets his chance and gets to come over here and play. But uh, if Suzuki ever comes over, he's going to be he's going to be special. Yeah, that'd be fun. Thanks, Susan, for those. Thanks, Craig. Craig. On a related question, Craig, you mentioned like when you saw Scott, you knew he was going to succeed, and you you said that you can you feel like you could kind of tell um, when guys were going to succeed in Japan. What what indicates that to you? Is it are you talking about just the way he's throwing, or more than that? It, it goes down to more than that. It it goes down to a mindset. You can you can look at a guy that's been over there and realize that he's accepted the culture he's he wants to learn the game and and then obviously you have i mean as far as pitchers i mean obviously every japanese teams they want that guy that throws a hundred but and I, i've i saw it a bunch of times we'd have a guy come in that throws a hundred first thing they're going to do is teach him a split and a good slider something that goes into the dirt i mean and it was I saw a lot of those guys that said, no, I'm not doing that. I'm just going to try to blow it by these guys. And there was a couple of them that I'd say, these little guys are going to hit it or they're going to make you throw 35 pitches in one at bat and foul off every single one of them until you go, good God, I'm just going to lay one over the plate. Then whack, double in the gap. I mean, and going going back to that, talk about um, when guys hit BP and the marks on their back. How how insane is that where – just the sweet spots worn out and the rest of the paint's yeah. brand new. Oh yeah. I mean, BP, the back it, roll. it's, I mean, they wear a bear, a barrel out. I mean, you see just the barrel just disappear. And, and I mean, I can even say, I saw guys work on hitting foul balls. Abe did and they, it every- and they were barreling balls up. I mean, these were things going off the barrel. So, I mean, it's things like that that you've got to learn. I can I can remember going in like my first spring training, even with the Tigers, I had foul ball practice, and I'm going, what in the hell am I doing? But it made me a better hitter. And there was a couple other foreign players that went over there and said, I'm not doing this stupid stuff. They were gone by halfway through the year. It's the openness, the willingness, and openness to accept the culture, and really learn the game. I mean, because as soon as you think you're better than the Japanese game, these these guys will kick your butt quick. Because there's if, some. Go ahead. I was gonna say, if you watch batting practice and like guys in the outfield, 
it's pretty easy to see the foreigners because the foreigners that aren't happy there, they're usually by themselves or they're with another foreigner in a corner somewhere. And, and then the guys that have been there for a while are fitting in, you know, they're joking around with different players. They're running, they're doing, they're still doing the drills. Um, and, and you see, you know, the hitter wise, they'll come out and take their BP and then go in, you know, yeah. and then you'll see other guys out there. They'll take their BP and then they'll sit around and talk to people or they'll, you know, they'll come out and help shag. And it's just, it's night and day difference to see the guys that, that are going to succeed over there or give themselves the opportunity to succeed. Yeah, it definitely, it, it is definitely like that. Cause I know towards, even at towards the end of my career, I hit in the last group. So I went out and I mean, when I was Chiba, I was DHing. So I didn't really have to worry about field, but I went out and fielded ground balls just because I loved doing it. And it was fun to get out there with those guys and see how good they are with their hands and hey, it might benefit me down the road, being able to teach somebody what these guys have taught me. And I mean, and then even with the Tigers, I think um, my manager, Miami, he told me stop coming out so much because I would be out there from the beginning all the way to the end. And just because I enjoyed it, I embraced it. And I mean, and your batting practices, I mean, as a hitter, you, I mean, you got 10 minutes yourself just to hit. So you took advantage of it. Cool. Cool. Thanks for that. All right. We have a special guest here. Hey, Jim. Welcome. Going to you. Hey. Good to have you on here. Okay. There you go. Oh, it's good uh, to see you guys. And uh, nice to see you, Shane. Um, I got a, I got a zillion questions as always, but I get to ask my questions nonstop. So I'll, uh, and I'm enjoying everybody else's. So thanks for the great questions. Um, Scott, I want to ask uh, about Tatsunori Hara and what it was like to to play for him. And if there was something, you know, people ask me all the time, uh, you know, what makes him special? And I have my opinion, but I'm I'm really curious to hear yours. You know, what has made him uh, made him a success for so many years? I mean, he just has that aura with him. Uh, you can see my first th three years, we won everything. You know, the fourth year I was over there, we came second, and that's when he stepped down. Mm -hmm. And you know, they bring him back, and we win again. Like it's, and then look at them this year. It's, it's truly amazing. It's we'd always call it horror magic. It's anything he did was, uh, was magic. It worked. It, you know, even if it didn't make sense, it worked. And I think that people trust him. Uh, you know, one, he has that presence. He's intimidating. He has that. You know. That I mean, at least on the field, no, nobody's ever going to cross him. It, what he says goes, and the experience that goes with it. I mean, you know, he he tells you something with confidence, and I feel like when someone portrays something to you and they're very confident with it, it kind of it go, you you have confidence in that as well. And uh, it, it's it doesn't matter who was on the mound. You know, he 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 would believe in them and he wouldn't throw someone out or he would pull someone out real quick if he didn't believe in them. And, uh, you know, he, he was out there to win, which I loved about Japan is, you know, when I first got over there is we're there to win. We're there for nothing else. You know, we're at the highest level of baseball, you know, besides the major leagues and we're there to win. And that's what I was excited about and what I wanted to do. So, you know, I, I really enjoyed playing for him and, you know, I was fortunate enough to get to, you know, have a lot of private dinners with him and, you know, a really good relationship with him over the years. And, um, you know, he's someone that I, I look up to and I always will. And uh, Craig, uh, I'm Scott uh, has talked a lot about, uh, about his relationship with uh, Shinosuke Abe and Craig, I want to ask you, are there any Japanese players that you had a really good, you know, you looked up to and maybe who taught you things about, I mean, not just about baseball, but you uh, learn things from. You know, I was, I was fortunate to get to play against the Giants a lot. Um, Abe obviously taught me a lot just by watching, watching from afar, the way he played the game, because I knew him and I were similar hitters. Um, hit the ball out of the ballpark all at, it didn't matter where in the ballpark. Um, but then I also got to play with Tiny Moto. So, I mean, that was, that's one of your great Japanese baseball players. I mean, just his, 
present in a, presence in a clubhouse was amazing. Um, watching him and, and a lot of times it was, he was one of the guys saying, Hey, try this, think about hitting this way or going up the middle more, go up, go the other way. And then I, I'll give praise to probably the, the biggest person that helped me the most in Japan is Alex Ramirez. I really will say that. Rami and I talked a lot. Um, from the day I got there, Rami was the first one to come up, talk to me, say, here, here's my number. Give me a call if you ever need me. And he was amazing. The things he taught me playing over there it was truly that it changed my career when I went to the Tigers to play against him that much about, Hey, all they want you to do is just roll over the ball and try to hit a home runs, start hitting that inside pitch the other way. You start hitting it the other way more. They're going to make mistakes out over the plate a lot more. And I saw that in 09, 10, not a little bit in 11, not son, not so much in 12, but I mean, it was, there's a lot of guys in Japan that really helped me out a lot. And, but I will have to say, Rami was one of the biggest influences of my career in Japan. You know what? I, I will agree with you that um, when I first got to Japan, he reached out to me and gave me his number and said, if there's anything I can do to help you, you know, we were playing against each other at the time. Um, and then he had a restaurant over there at the time that we'd go and eat at the, his restaurant a lot after the games. And um, you know, even though, he was on a different team. He was always willing to help. And uh, it was, um, yeah, he, he's definitely someone who's done a lot for Japanese baseball and a lot for foreigners in Japanese baseball. No, thanks. That's, um, I, I don't want to hog the conversation. That's my job. So. <laughs> no worries. You've got anything else? Just you're, you're welcome, Jim. You're always welcome. Um, but in the meantime, Eric, you've been waiting patiently. Go back to you. Guys, um, for Scott, was there any particular hitter that you had a lot of success against, and then maybe one that um, was tough? And then I guess for Craig, any pitcher that you enjoyed hitting against or had a lot of success against, and then anyone that's, that stood out as being exceptionally tough? Um, success against early on, all the Tigers. I, I love pitching against the Tigers. <laughs> I, 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 I love pitching against them. I don't know. I felt like I racked up a lot of strikeouts early on, but. Someone that I really struggled against was Wada with the Dragons. Oh. I, man, for years, I couldn't get him out. He was probably hitting 700 off me. And it wasn't until his last season that um, it wasn't on purpose. It was actually a pitch slipped on me, but I threw it up and in on him. And I've never seen him get so mad in the box. And so I repeated it. I went up and in on him again and knocked him down. And he couldn't hit me after that. But I mean, there was a good four years there that three, four years that man, I couldn't get them out. I mean, for me, I mean, obviously as a hitter, you can always, everybody's going to always say Darvish, Tanaka. You know, I had a, I had a couple good, good at bats against uh, Tanaka and Darvish, but um, the pitcher that gave me the most trouble was, um, uh, his now I can't he, he was with the Tigers in 2010 I actually think he was the MVP that year um it'll come to me I cannot remember his name but this guy was all of five foot five 125 pounds and was throwing 98 to 100 and throwing splits that were ungodly his, his name will pop in my head, but that was a guy that it'll, oh man, now it's bothering me. I can't remember his name, but, um, and as far as pitchers, I liked hitting, there was a kid with a carp that I think I was nine for nine against. And we actually cleared the benches because my 10th at bat against him, he threw at me three times and missed me. And finally, I was just like, if you're going to hit me, hit me, come on, let's go. And, uh, but no, the, there was a lot of good battles in Japan. That's awesome. Awesome, thanks. Thanks for that, Eric. Ian, going back to you. 
Um, Craig, I was just wondering if you could talk about the ball change from 2010 to 2011 because everybody's oh. offense decreased, like including yours. So, like, can you just talk about yeah. the difference in the ball? Um, I can honestly tell you the ball changed so much that pitchers that had four ERAs went down to one ERAs. And this is nothing against the pitchers. Hey, more power to you. Make that money. But I will say I can remember times where I would get a ball thrown to me at first base and it would be lopsided like an egg. I've never seen balls so soft. I mean, I think Ramirez only hit 20 home runs that year and he had 49 the year before. I mean, or 50. And, uh, but it was ungodly. That, that made pitchers, I mean, obviously Darvish was unhittable. Tanaka went is even more unhittable. Um, it was it was like throwing a mush ball, but the, with the, the most raised scenes you could ever see in your life. And when you hit it, you could crush it, and it went nowhere. I mean, it, it was it was sickening to play, and that was like that eleven season for me. I think if you look, I think I had more hits to to left field because I had to forget about the home run because it was not going to happen. It was, all right, I'm just going to shoot the ball up the middle of the way and see what I can do because that ball was just, it was mush. There was nothing we could do about it. And every, every hitter hated it. Felt like 2012 and 13, the ball was pretty dead too. I mean, I, I had a low one ERA both those years and, you know, going up to 2014, it, you know, we showed up and it felt like spring training, every ball was flying out of the park. And I felt like yeah, that 13 changed a lot. Yeah. And for me, I noticed it at the end of 13, I started seeing the balls get a little bit harder. Yeah. Um, Cause I remember playing at Chiba and hitting one off the lights at Chiba and went, wait a minute, what in the, what's, what's going on? And then the next year, the balls were just flying at the ballpark because you started seeing the little guys started hitting them again. Yeah. I think I only gave up one home run that year, and it was like to Willie Mopena, who's <laughs> – Yeah, the, that, that, it doesn't matter. Live that, like, you know, and, and it probably was first row or something. It was – I'd get yeah. in trouble, just leave a ball up over the middle of the plate and, you know, try to hit it. As, oh, yeah. Ball go anywhere. Yeah, there was a lot of guys that you would see in 11 that – I mean, even playing in the Tokyo Dome, it didn't matter. It would not travel there. And Yokohama, it didn't travel. I mean, Koshin, you could forget about it. I mean, that was just a graveyard. And then you go down to uh, Hiroshima with that hot, muggy air. Oh, pitchers, a lot of times, I saw more fastballs out over the plate, and they just say, here, see how far you can hit it. <laughs> Nothing. Yeah. I agree with you, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You definitely saw 13. It was a huge pickup over 12. Yeah. But it was, I felt like even at four, in 2014, the balls were ridiculous at the beginning of the year. Yeah. Yeah. They, they it was, it was a big change because I can remember like taking bat in practice in Chiba <laughs> and literally hitting them out of the stadium going, what in the hell? I said, I'm getting old. I know I don't have that anymore. <laughs> I remember, I remember them coming in and telling us like the balls were stored in a, you know, to drive a facility in China somewhere or something. Yeah. There's some use for that, but yeah. Yeah, something about it. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> right? Wow, that's a yeah, good question. That's fascinating stuff. Um, Yumi is asking in the chat, she's curious if either of you are interested in, in coaching in Japan if the opportunity came up. Mm, if the opportunity was right, yeah, I probably would jump on it because, I mean, I know I can't coach over here. There, I, I can't just deal with the players these days. But Japanese, I would – I mean, I would love doing something over in Japan. How about you, Scott? Uh, me personally, right now, I wouldn't be – you know, I have two young kids, and I, I feel like it, it's quite a commitment. Um you know, I, I want to see my kids grow up and in the future, I mean, when they're, they're older, I would love to go over and do something like that, but I would like to, at some point, you know, maybe the scouting department or keep ties with the team somehow, but um, we'll see what plays out. You know, I'm, I, I definitely, I still follow the giants and I, 
it would have to be with the Giants. I don't think I'd go to any other team over in Japan. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thanks. James, I'm going to go to you because I know you had a question. Oh, hi, Craig and Scott. Uh, I dug out some baseballs you guys gave me uh, back in like uh, 2010, 2012. Uh, I, I, was, I was at a Tigers uh, A's game. It was like the opening yeah. series. There was like a 500 people there. So uh, you were nice just Thanks, Craig. Um, yeah. Scott, even though I'm a Tigers fan, you still gave me a ball, so I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, you guys are always nice to us. I don't know why the pitchers, uh, uh, you know, we, we hate each other during the game, but before the game, I always like talking to you guys. So, oh uh, man, for me, it, when you're on the field and off the field, it's completely night and day different. Yeah. Off the field, I, I'll go out with anybody, and you know, I'll talk to anybody on the field. I'm out for blood. So it, yeah, that, that's, yeah, I, I'd say that's the same way here. I mean, I, it was, for me, it was when that umpire said play ball, it was, they've talked about athletes having that switch. It went on and I didn't care who was out there. I wanted to hurt you. And I mean, not mean hurt you physically, but I wanted to hurt. There, hurt there's a few players I to hurt physically too, though. <laughs> well, that too. Yeah. Yeah. There were a few, <laughs> But when I was out there, that that's what, I mean, I had just the tunnel vision. I mean, like Scott said, when he was on the mound, he didn't hear anything. I didn't hear anything, but it was me and that pitcher. So, wow. but, yeah. yeah. To me, that's, that's oh. the best part about baseball right there is how there's a, it's a one-on-one -on -one aspect within a team game. It's just, you know, like yes. pitcher, it's hitter, pitcher, pitcher, catcher, hitter. And that's all, that's all you see. That's all you hear, you know, regardless of how many people are there. Yeah. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, I, yeah, it's like a love-hate relationship. I, I, in fact, I even wrote a book called Yellow and Black Fever about my experiences as a Tigers fan. But uh, you guys aren't in there yet. It's it's before you guys got there. But uh, um, yeah, the Tigers, the Tigers, I would think more of or more of the yellow fever. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there, it's more of a fever. You don't get to win very often. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um. I just had a quick question for you. Besides that, um, you said Ogusawara was my favorite player, uh, besides Tigers, and and Abe is my wife's favorite player. Uh, I mean, did you guys speak English to them, or you spoke Japanese, or a little mix of both? Or I mean, you're out in the base paths. I mean, uh, well, just curious. I mean, definitely a good mix. Of, towards the end, but definitely a good mix of both. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's it's amazing how many guys can speak English over there, huh. and you know, one of my favorite memorabilia I have right now is a it's a jersey that Abe signed for me and I, I mean it for most people it wouldn't make sense at all what he wrote on there but you know he there's a nice English message on there and it, it's just to me that he went out of his way in a language that he doesn't even know to write it, it meant a lot to me oh, that's yeah good. and that was really what it was at the beginning of my career it was English and oh yeah uh -huh, I understand you but Towards the end of my career, it was it was a lot of English Japanese mixed together, um, because they knew I understood a lot more than I could speak, and I mean that, and and like you said, a lot of the players can speak English, and uh, that, and you'll find that if they've accepted you, they'll start speaking a lot more English to you, and 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 want to know about you stuff. All right, great. Well, I, I lived there for twelve years. I, I was just like you guys. Yeah. Uh, oh bad foreigner and then i got better and better accepting everything so <laughs> yeah thanks a lot i loved watching you guys play a dream come true to talk to you guys uh, thank you very much yeah thank you thank you all right i think we're gonna wrap it up soon here anyone else have questions jim you got any more questions you want to ask gabe does all right gabe we're going to you i got one more for scott if all you right. don't mind yeah uh, I have to ask, because I visited there back in, I think, 2018 or 2019, the Canadian Baseball Hall of Fame in St. Mary's. I bet you they're going to be calling you in a couple of years. Do you have any merchandise there? Or uh, if they ring you up, what would you send? Um, they do. They have a glove of mine. Uh, they have a few things. A hat, a glove. Um, and then, actually, I, I talked to them a fair, a fair bit, and I was supposed to go up for um, to see Morneau get in, uh, get in this year, but obviously COVID is put a big damper on that 
Um, but no, I talked to Scott Crawford a little bit with the Canadian Hall of Fame, and I'm hoping I have never been there, so I'd like to get up and check it out. When I went, it was still just the original building. They've expanded it since, and I'd love to get the chance to go back. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm hoping for. And uh, my wife and uh, I, one of our plans is to do a big cross continent trip and, you know, drive all the way up the East Coast and straight across Canada, and then down the West Coast and back. So nice. that'll be a stop on the way. Thanks for taking the question, Scott. And my earlier one, Craig, thanks again. No problem. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Gabe. All right, Jim, you're up. Okay, before I let you guys go, uh, now I know both of you talked uh, extensively about uh, embracing the opportunities that Japan gave to you and having a new start, but uh, you know, it, we've all been through this point where there's, there comes a day or comes in a moment, maybe it's a very brief moment, where you, you have to ask yourself a question, is this really what I want to do? You know, is this, was there, was, what was the instant or maybe the most challenging uh, thing that happened to you early on where you maybe questioned why you were there or if, uh, if this was the right move for you? Well, I can only say, you know, I go, I come over with Sabo, um, got injured and yeah. I think the second or third second round of the playoffs or something like that. Right. I didn't get to play in the Japan series. Go back the next year, go to spring training in Baltimore and just am tearing it up. Release first day of the season. I'm sitting here going, what in the world is going on? So I go to St. Paul for literally, I think I was there a week, two weeks, played in four games and was still just, it was, I think, five or six home runs. Yeah. I mean, just craziness. And the tigers came calling and it literally took my wife convincing me to say, Hey, this is a move for us to come back. Cause I wasn't a hundred percent sure I wanted to come back to Japan and really go back to that atmosphere because I was having a lot of calls from major league teams saying, Hey, uh, well, do you want to come right across the street to Minnesota and start playing? And, uh, that was the turning point because I remember because my wife was God probably four months pregnant then and dealing with a hormonal pregnant wife that was one of the turning points of my life right there she pretty much cracked that whip and said get your butt on that plane and go play baseball in Japan <laughs> uh, for, for me while I was in Japan I can honestly say I don't think I had that moment really? I uh you know, as crazy as the Giants, I think I was expecting a lot worse because you hear about so many foreigners talk talk about the Giants and mostly guys that never made it and never made it, you know, a career over there. Um, but I loved every minute playing in Japan. I mean, baseball, I've had those moments before. Um, sure. You know, in 2010, I finished the year. I was minor league pitcher of the year for the Phillies. And, you know, I threw like one inning in the big leagues that year. Like in 2011, I was the last cut of the spring training. I don't think I, you know, gave up a run in spring training and I ended up pitching in like four innings. It was, um, right. And it, those were tough times. Uh, going through my third elbow surgery, <clears throat> uh, there was many times where I, you know, I was every day on, on the internet or well, reading the paper at the time, looking at jobs, looking at schools and, you know, thinking I'm going to cash in. The Phillies have to pay for my education. It's maybe it's a better chance, better choice for me to go and get a degree and start, you know, trying to figure out, you know, being an adult. But uh, once I got to Japan, it was cruise control. I, I loved it. I had a blast. Um, you know, there was every year the season would finish, I'd want to come back with the Giants. And there, there was one or two years where I had some very enticing offers to come back to the States, but it, you know, the Giants came and just, they made a better offer. And I, I was always happy to go back. It, so Japan, I can honestly say that I had a lot of fun there. And I, I, I was very happy. Yeah, I kind yeah, of, I, can, I, I kind of expected that, to be honest. I was, I knew it might be a challenge for you, but I appreciate the answer. I mean, I was very fortunate to play on very good teams over there. We had two, two rough years, but other than that, I mean, 
shoot 50, you know, I won four championships out of eight years being there. That's pretty unreal. Uh, it was, I, I was in a good situation and, you know, I, I think I got in at the right time and, uh, you know, I wish I was still playing and I wish I was still there. It, it takes, you know, people, people ask me and, and I, I, I've never played, you know, I don't, as I said to somebody, I don't know a curveball from a goofball, but the, it takes a little bit, you know, it takes a special kind of tolerance and humility to sometimes accept the rules that, you know, or the, the situation that the Tigers and Giants will put you in. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. And with Craig, I know 2011 was very hard. I know with Alex Ramirez, it was very hard Yeah. Uh, when they changed the ball. And I, and I know Matt talked about it a lot about how much they were, the team was willing to throw the foreigners to the media, you know, like oh, sharks. Yeah. That must have been really hard. <laughs> yeah, the uh, I, I'm I saw it a lot more with the Tigers. I mean, they would throw you in there real quick. Yeah, I mean, when they were done with you, they were done with you. It didn't matter what type of year you had; they would just say, "See ya." We don't care. I mean, because I know, <laughs> I think they let Jason Standridge go, and he had a great year. I mean, it, and Merton leaves, and I mean, it was just, it was, it's something that you don't expect, but uh, it's, it's part of who they are, I guess. <laughs> I mean, the, I know the Tigers um, it, are a little, I think a little meaner than other teams are about a lot of stuff, but uh, I will say I did, it finally popped in my head, the pitcher that the lady asked me that owned me, that pretty much owned the league, and Jim, you'll remember, a sow with Junichi who blew his arm out. Oh yeah. my God, Scott, if you'd have seen this kid pitch in his prime, we're talking 98 to a hundred splits at 95. And he threw, I think 82 games in one year. And he was the setup man and he was MVP. He was yeah. ungodly. I mean, it, this, and he was maybe 140 pounds soaking wet. Yeah. Just we used to, a, oh my God. We used to joke when he was uh, coming up with uh, Tyrone Woods and we used to talk about how, you know, he had to get permission from his mother to, to pitch in night games because he, he was 23 or 24 then, but he, he looked like he was 14. I know. And God, I mean, when it, that's the one kid I would have said he could pitch in the major leagues with that stuff right now. And it broke my heart when he blew his arm out because, mm. God, he was – I mean, I used to look at – we get to the sixth inning and, the, and playing the Dragons, and I go, okay, am I going to hit in the eighth? That's, <laughs> I'd rather place, face the old, the old lefty closer than him because he was – it was not fun. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for, yep. Thanks for those questions, Jim. Um, and thank you guys. We're at the uh, hour and a half mark here. That flew by, so I'll wrap it up here. But uh, thank you both for joining us and, and for your candid answers and your insights. It was really interesting stuff. And um, I, I particularly, and I, I think everyone else on the call too, who most of us on the call, had, it got up to about 30, 30 people. I think all of us are, uh, have been to Japan, um, if not lived in Japan, to watch baseball. And we can appreciate a lot what you're saying about how great of a country it is and, and the difference between going in and really trying to embrace um, the differences and, and or just trying to create your own kind of bubble in another country and uh, you're preaching to the choir here and it's cool to hear um, ball players who really have that approach. So um, but yeah, thanks. Thanks again for, for uh, joining us. And um, I've told you guys both, if you ever need help, um, promoting anything or you know you're a friend of the program now um, so uh, I really appreciate it and, and I know a lot of people who um, are going to be tuning in to watch this on YouTube afterwards uh, because the debate and, and whatnot um, so uh, we, all of our community really appreciates having you on so thank you well Shane no thank you problem. thank you yeah